The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name is Andrew Rocks and welcome to the Engine Room podcast in 2024. Uh, today. Sound guy and I are in quite possibly the best view we've ever had for a podcast. I hope this is translating to everyone's ears, but um, we're looking here, looking over the stunning Sydney Harbour on a glorious blue day with the Emerald City completely glistening, and I've got in front of me a dynamic, powerful couple who've got a great story to tell, and uh, and they're not finished yet. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Jackie Sherlock and Andrew Sherlock. Welcome to the Engine Room. Thanks very much. Really enjoying being here today and looking forward to talking to you. Thanks. And you guys have looked after us very, very well. And I suppose when, you know, quite a few people in the industry might know of the name and and I can't wait to unpack a little bit about where you've come from and what you're doing as far as building out your business. Um, And where I'd like to start with that is a little bit of the backstory of how you've come to, to be here. And maybe, Andrew, if you could kick off, and maybe, Jackie, you know, you could tell us about uh, the 2.0 or the 3.0, whatever you want to say as far as Sherlock Wells. Over to you, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure what iteration we're up to, but um, we'll delve into that. So the business has been in operation for in excess of 50 years. So it is a, a second-generation family business started by my father back in 1970, uh, back in the days when it was uh, – I don't know, financial planning existed as it does in the current way that it does, but he started out as an insurance broker. And uh, my background then is initially as after doing an economics degree at university, moving into chartered accounting land before moving into funds management land at BT and getting quite interested in the financial advice process whilst I was working at Bankers Trust and studying. So you didn't jump straight into the family business, Andrew? No, so I had a good decade uh, doing other things, which I think was important. And uh, you know, the experience at BT was a particularly good one leading into this. Although I'll have to put my hand uh, on my heart and say that was more by fluke than by design. Uh, and I and I got to studying a bit of stuff, and you know, even did a bit of study under Gwen Fletcher, who was you know considered the you know the mother of financial planning in Australia, and just really started to it started to resonate with me. And I got talking to Dad and said, look, would it make sense if I came across and joined in with you? You can teach me everything that you know over the last 30 years on the insurance side, and I can bring what I've learned and understood from the the strategic planning, the tax planning, and the investment advisory piece to offer a more comprehensive and holistic service to our clients. And what what year was that? That was in 2000. And what Okay, so in 2000, just in time for the tech wreck, which no doubt was (laughs) one of the many ups and downs that we'll we'll, we'll, we'll discuss – and what was the moment, the impetus? Because the companies that you mentioned, they're pretty well-established businesses. Uh, BT was one of the darlings in the 90s um, that everyone was aware of. What was the moment that you said yes or was it more that y- your father said, I need help? Or, or what, what, what was the trigger 
Yeah, good question. I don't think he'd never put any form of uh, pressure on me or really maybe you could even say any form of encouragement on me to move across and join with him. So it really came from me. I think he just let me do my own thing and come to him eventually over time. I think the sort of immediate impetus was probably that BT had been through a number of ownership and structural changes and it was just getting to the point where they wanted to lock me in to manage a group and I just sort of thought, is it fair for me to do that with the knowledge that I want to probably move into this financial planning and work for myself? So that was my trigger to move at that particular point in time and I just approached Dad and said, what do you think? And uh, I, yeah, he was pretty pleased. Yeah, and look, the, the reason for going along this line of questioning is is – uh, in my experience, um, talking with uh, multi-generational financial planning businesses, um, and we had some crackers on in last year, um, it's that it's that mutual timeframes that seem to work. You know, when's the right time? And 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 I feel that anyone um, that had potentially maybe have been compelled or, or felt a sense of duty have been ones that have struggled. So uh, I suppose well, I, I applaud you. But that's um, that was twenty years ago, and 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 Jackie. Yes. Um, maybe give us a bit of a feel for how did you end up um, here um, and also operating, you know, a really progressive business. I must say we're in North Sydney, everyone, for those who are wondering how what, what views of what, what a harbour. So it's not the it's not the Brisbane Harbour or, or, the, or even the, the Swan River, it's the Sydney Harbour. <laughs> well, I think how I came to work for the business is a slightly different story. Uh, my background's in public relations and marketing, yeah working in-house agency, companies like McDonald's, Volvo, SAP, Oracle, Intel back in the day. And then I'd taken some time out of the workforce to have our three beautiful daughters. And it was probably, uh, what year was it? About 2012. Um, Andrew kept trying to put me on a budget. And I said to him one day, you know what? I'm sick of you trying to put me on a budget, Andrew. Why don't you just earn more? <laughs> and in fact, why aren't you? And he reeled off a long list of reasons why he wasn't. And I said to him, oh my goodness, babe, do you want me to come in and help you? And he said, yeah, I would actually. So um, I started out, it, the brief was to come in and work one day a week and just help him out with a few probably marketing things actually. Uh, but it very quickly morphed into something else. And it was probably largely because at the time we had just engaged with Peloton and uh, they came in and did a, a big review of the business. And, and they would have done pricing and value and all stuff of like that. that as well. And yeah. um, we ended up hiring them and they helped us through a critical phase of transformation of the business. Yeah. And as part of that review, they realized, or we all realized, that Andrew was probably spending 40 to 50% of his time actually running the business rather than working on the clients and that's what he loves the best. So I very quickly was asked to come in as general manager and basically take off the 40% of his time that he was doing on the business and take that over. So And and that was um so you came in in 2012, mm. okay? Um and I think from memory that also uh, coincided with the first iteration of Fofa. Um, so although it was years for it got implemented, uh, as a fellow advisor in that period of time, um, it was quite a scary proposition in that you'd built all of your profit models and you built all your enumeration models around a certain cost of goods. Yeah. And there was a real uncertainty around, you know, uh, what, where it would go to. I mean, here we are in, you know, over a decade later and we, we know where it's got to and it's had to make businesses change. And, mm. and uh, further to your point of, of coming in after, um, you know, starting a family, I see that a lot where, um, you know, you, your career prior, you had more than, more than enough firepower to be able to do the job. Yeah. Um, and so can I ask why you guys went with you wanting to, to do the exercise rather than sort of engaging a, a third party? Yeah, so Roxy, I think I, I stepped up because I enjoyed it and uh, Peloton had come in and reviewed all, all the team members and there was an overriding, we love Jackie since she's arrived, it's been a breath of fresh air. So, um, and, it, and I guess the kids were at, at the right age for it and, and look, there was probably a, a cost decision in there too. Uh, probably at that time we couldn't afford to pay somebody in that role. So, I came in. Andrew and I have actually always really enjoyed working together. We find that we align on the big picture and then we go about doing the the day to day uh, separately. So we don't we don't tread on each other's toes. We don't overlap too much. So that's worked really well. Um, I love learning about the components of running a successful business, 
and I'm so driven by that. And every single day I learn something new. So it's been fantastic. Loved it. And look, I've been in your office for, you know, graciously for an hour beforehand um, doing some stuff and it's a really impressive office with, you know, lots of structure, lots of motivation. Everywhere you look, there's attention to detail. Um, so where you are today, um, uh, the, the journey that you've got to, I, I wouldn't mind just changing gears uh, a little bit. Um, and I haven't got to the whether or not you can still budget properly, but as I say, um, that's for a different <laughs> we, we, point. I'm happy to loop back to that because, um, <laughs> well, just on that note, a lot of our clients come to us and they say to me especially, I hope Andrew's not going to put me on a budget. And I said, don't worry. <laughs> and, and in fact, actually, surprisingly, I think through the work that we do with our clients, they end up being able to spend more. Absolutely, yeah. I think it sort of ties into a lot of the clients that we we deal with, and our our promise is to make their lives better, not to you know, make their lives worse. So we want to find out ways to obviously bring about whatever it is that they want to try and achieve. Well, let's talk about the clients. Yeah. What's, what sort of clients do you, you? Well, you know, with your history, you had a lot of insurance clients, and be really interesting to hear how you've metamorphosized from predominantly insurance over the last ten years, given that your respective backgrounds. Sure. The type of clients you've got now, and where, where's the go forward? Yeah. Okay. Well, look. I mean, how we've metamorphosized. Metamor- can I say that word again? <laughs> metamorphosized. Is that the right word? That's it. It's alliteration uh, Sunday. Why, why don't right. we just say morphed? <laughs> yeah, morphed. Morphed would be easier. Uh, look, in some respects, it's it's been a difficult process because it has been like turning around the Titanic. The name Sherlock was very well known in the insurance space, so it's taken quite a lot of education of our clients and our prospective clients as centres of influence for them to understand that, you know, we do a lot more than just the insurance piece now. But when I joined the business, it was probably typical of a lot of businesses at that point in time, having a number of thousand, probably 2,000 to 2,500 clients. We'd take on anyone, no matter how little you know, commission or fee that they would pay. And in fact, I laugh back when we think about that initial meeting with Peloton and them working with us to reprice clients and me being extremely nervous about asking anyone to pay a fixed fee of $1,500. <laughs> and I now look back and just laugh at that and think how, you know, how immature we were on the journey. So I think we've done, you know, what other businesses have, have done as well, but we really restructured the business. We cut back down the number of clients to a much more profitable subset of clients by moving them on to another firm that could better look after them and their needs. Excellent. And we did that to both the comprehensive financial planning clients and to a subset of the risk clients where we just really weren't earning enough money off those individuals to make them worth servicing. And where does it sit today? What's a client look like? So, well, the client looks like We've got about 95 family groups that we're offering comprehensive financial advice to. Some of those will have insurance, some of those won't have insurance depending on their needs and we've retained a a core group of about 200 odd risk only clients as well. But again, we're sort of targeting a minimum uh, ongoing remuneration structure out of those types of clients. And Jackie, with the the actual nuts and bolts of of, uh, getting a bit of a feel for the business, how does it work? Because Andrew's not the only advisor. What's what's the org structure? You know, what's 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 how do you deliver on, on, to these wonderful families um, on your, your your mission statement? Yeah, so we've got our client and uh, so our service and advice teams. So we've got Andrew, Blake, and Connor sitting in the advice teams, uh, headed up by Andrew as our head of advice. Then we've got our service team headed by Crystal, who's been with us nearly 20 years as our head of service. Let's just pause on that. I know. So I, I, I did do a bit of LinkedIn stalking and I, I, I sort of went, well, 20 years, she's got a different surname. She, <laughs> I, you know, um, the, that's someone with a, a great tenure and, yeah. um, you know, she'd be worth talking to. Really, really is, is, um, you know, knows a lot about, not just where you are, but but everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she's, if I could step in here, she's a very important part of the team, obviously. She knows the clients pretty well as well as I do. All the clients love her and the service that they get from her. And she's just really enjoyed her journey as well. And I think part of the reason that she's had the tenure she's had and she's had the loyalty that she's had with our firm is she hasn't obviously just sat there doing the same thing year in, year out for 20 years. She came on board. She was our receptionist very very junior and she's been very keen to learn and progress over time she's done the dfp she's become educated in the financial advice process and so the value that she can add to our clients as the head of client service has you know improved over time dramatically as well and one thing we always say to our team you know we've been here a long time because clearly we're we're trusted and respected 
but we're going to be here for a long time because we're really great at adapting and pivoting. And I think Crystal has been a really good example of being able to pivot and adapt as the industry has changed, as we've changed as as a business. And uh, so credit to her. But, yes, somebody said to me, look, she practically is a Sherlock, which is probably (laughs) true. No, well, well, uh, we're not not in the business of collecting extra family. (laughs) I think uh, (laughs) – I think uh, that, that, that affects that budget conversation. Yes. As fellow potential empty nesters, we're looking forward to the next 100%. 10 years. <laughs> so um, with the types of clients, how, how do you typically, like if I'm a client, how do you deliver advice? Uh, um, do you use any technology? Um, is cash flow, you know, super relevant? Maybe give us a feel for, for what you're doing as far as the clients. Yeah, I think the clients that we typically service end up being reasonably complicated or complex. They often have multiple structures. They might have family trusts. They might have their own businesses. So they might have cash flow moving around in a lot of different places. So whilst we're not moving to straight away, put them on a budget and say, this is all you can spend, looking at where that cash flow goes and how it's delivered to the client from a tax point of view as well is really important. So we're very big on strategy and structure first. So we'll work with a lot of our clients to deliver a piece of strategic advice that has absolutely nothing to do with product that's just around here are some different options as to how you could potentially get to where you want to go. And in fact, we'll then get them back in, deliver that piece of advice. And once we've got buy-in across the family group, then we'll move forward to some of the specific nuts and bolts where we need to deliver an SOA around what product, what investments, you know, do we need to change here or not? And um, I'm sitting here in a lovely boardroom does that sort of get a? Do they feel a bit like it's a private office? Is that sort of the, the, the sort of the experience that they feel? Whether yeah. or not you feel that, is that what you think they feel? I think it is what they feel. Yes. I mean, I, I don't know whether all of them have a, you know, first-hand experience with other private offices, but I think that's definitely the type of service that we aim to deliver them, and the type of experience that we aim to deliver them. I mean, all our clients are very busy. You know, they've got multiple children. Usually, often have multiple properties complicated lives. They like to go on holidays. They might be renovating their houses. So they've got a lot going on. And so in certainly in offering a family office style approach, it means that everything is in one place for them. And we very much believe in having the right advisors in your life at any one time. And we put ourselves in the center and we gather the necessary advisors. So whether that's in-house or whether we're bringing in the estate planning lawyer or the accountant or wh- whoever's needed at the time, this is this is the place where the clients can come. And it makes sure that the strategy is cohesive. Uh, a lot of clients, when they first come to us, they might have made a good decision over here, but then the decision that they've made over there is actually count- counterproductive to that decision. So, it really does ensure that all of their financial affairs are working together to get them to their goals. So, thank you very much, Jackie. Now, when when I when you mentioned you've got some other advisors, you've got Andrew and Blake, um, and Connor. Connor, sorry, I've just uh, <laughs> so, apologies, Connor, if you're listening. Um, you better be listening. Um, <laughs> the the way in which you've structured, so you've got yourself a CEO, you've got a few, bit of a head of advice, head of uh, head of ops, ops manager, yep. you've got associates. Does that mean that you're running a pod structure? Do you use external consultants? Um, maybe get us a feel for sort of how you turn all of this wonderful sort of position statements and strategies into the doing of the doing because you're right, your clients are, are, are time poor, so mm. we've got to have the, the machine that does it. Yep. So, yep, we have pods. So usually headed by an, an advisor and uh, then supported by the service associates. Uh, pleased to say we have we use VBP. Uh, so associate Chan, who's in the Philippines, and uh, we also use a bound para planning. And uh, DJ is actually based in Serbia, which actually works quite well. His day begins as ours ends, but as long as we've briefed him and had that chat, he can work all night. So really from a client perspective, it actually means that we can work twice as fast because you're working around the clock as a team. Oh, a big shout out to the team in Belgrave and a big shout out to the team in Cebu, like many practices. Um, yeah, So working with a mosaic of service providers basically means that you have, uh, a, a, you've got some great capability. You've also got scalability. So maybe question to you, Andrew, would there be any tips on um, 
uh, or do's and don'ts for, for working with providers in different time zones and whatnot. What would be your number one tip? Sure. No, number one tip using those external power planners is it gives a very strong incentive to brief the power planner correctly and 100% correctly in the first place so that you, the next day you get a plan rather than a bunch of questions. Or well, rather than that call at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what about um, yourself, Jackie? How, how do you – what have you guys – what steps have you taken to, to sort of uh, in, in, integrate um, these well, people? Particularly with the VBP team, we've made sure that we've included them as part of our team. So Shan always attends the daily huddles. Uh, we've just got team polos. So Shan's got a team polo. She's on our website. She's got a bio. Uh, so very much she attends our weekly team meetings. And uh, I think that's helped rather than picture them as something external. She's very much a part of the team, just happens to be in the Philippines. And unlike Serbia, the Philippines are basically on our same time zone. So I think from a service associate point of view, that's really good because they're dealing with lots of little things every day, whereas power planning can tend to be a, a big project. So we find that that works, being on a different time zone. Oh, and look, and Kieran, the sound guy, and I are looking forward to the Sherlock Wealth polos that I imagine are a part of every well, every every podcast engagement. Well, it was interesting. We just did a post uh, last week on social media because we'd had a great team planning day in Barangaroo and we all happened to be in our matching polos and we've had a couple of people say, when can I get one? So, Roxy, before you leave today, I'll get your size and uh, more than happy to give you a – Sherlock Wealth Polo. Maybe you'll wear it playing golf or potentially at pot the gym. Potentially, we'll, uh, we'll 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 see how that goes. At some, <laughs> um, we, we expect to see it around the North Shore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, getting back to having some pods, um, how do you? So, they a pod structure as 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 a, a CEO and mm -hmm. um, gives you an ability to measure and hold people to account. You know, the typically with the AR being, uh, you know, one of the revenue lines, how do you measure success um, in, in each one of those pods? Well, we're very outcomes driven and um, we have, everybody knows the targets. We've always got an overall team business target that we're all chasing. So that way we're not competing with each other. And then within that, we, we try and stay in our swim lanes. And the way we measure it is you've seen our whiteboards, <laughs> still love Excel, and uh, reporting in each week to the team meetings on how you're going with your goals and in your lanes. And, and what would be your 10-year North Star? Uh, well, we have two. <laughs> One's I pre-read everyone. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe sound smarter than I am. One's a financial BHAG uh, and then our we have also have a feel-good BHAG. Uh, the feel-good BHAG is to give and to receive a thousand messages of appreciation. Which uh, is also up on your wall. It's all yes, up on yes. our wall. We, we very much cultivate a culture of gratitude and, in fact, we start our team meetings each week with sending a message of gratitude to somebody. And then if you want that counted in the BHAG, that's up to you. Or if that happens to be a personal message, you don't have to count it. But we get a real kick out of receiving messages, whether it's via text, on the website, email, and, um, you know, growing growing that number. But I, I think our, our promise to our clients and to anybody that we work with actually – we promise that your life will be better through your association with us and whether that's through a, we help you make a big decision, we prevent you from making a bad one, down to we've filled out that application form for you, we've saved you a bit of time, to even this experience, anyone that we deal with each day, we want them at the end of the day to think that was a really great interaction I had with Sherlock Wealth. And so we find then when we get the messages back, we know that's what we've been doing and we've been doing it well. So it's good. We love it. Well, let's talk about the tools of the trade. What, what's the tech stack that you guys are uh, currently operating your business on? Tech stack currently is the primary tool for preparing advice is X-Plan and we've, through our licensee, have a sort of rebadged version of that. We're very much in the Office 365 environment, big users of the uh, Teams as well, so Teams for internal communications as well as running meetings with clients who can't or don't want to come into the office, even though it's beautiful and they should all come into the office. Uh, we use My Prosperity. We've been a, a pretty early adopter of that piece of technology to try and make sure both we and our clients have a really good overarching view of their finances. There's always 
certain things that we're not managing on behalf of our clients, yet those things are really important for us to know about to make sure that we don't make decisions that don't take into account those other things. So that's been a fabulous way for us to- It's called the Sherlock Wealth Portal. The Sherlock Wealth Portal. And And interestingly, um, we're going to maybe talk about the- some of the partners and platforms that you use. Um, it's interesting that you've been using My Prosperity for a long time, given what you mentioned before um, the meeting. Mm. So, um, what what other technology um, do you utilize? Uh, in terms of client monies, most of our client funds are sitting on uh, investment platform Hub Twenty Four. And probably hence the link to my prosperity, which well, has happened recently. Yeah, it's happened recently, so we're hoping to see some pretty good synergies come out of that. We were obviously using my prosperity before they were required by Hub Twenty Four, but we, we've been a an early adopter of the Hub Twenty Four story as well. We're particularly interested in the the managed account story there, and in a, in a little bit of an interesting anecdote, I found out only really as recently as last year or the year before that I was the first person who was not an employee of Hub Twenty Four to open up an a Hub Twenty Four IDPS account. Amazing, yes. amazing. So, if only we'd bought shares then too. <laughs> okay, so the, the, so the people who uh, who work with Hub who are listening to this, um, shout out! Uh, you've got you've got the original OG, um, and uh, with that uh, with that positioning, um, you know, Ensemble's all about the positive evolution of financial advice, and mm. that can sometimes mean you know putting you on the spot and asking for things, but. Given the state of relationship with Hub and also My Prosperity, is there anything that you'd like to see that they could do to assist your practice in the short term? I think uh, in terms of the My Prosperity piece, we're, we're also using it a lot for the uploading of documents to sign in a secure environment. So that's been helpful. But I think if we're just looking for tighter integration across both those platforms, i.e. maybe we start to see some of those non-custodial assets that are sitting on My Prosperity sit inside the Hub24 reporting platform. I'm not saying we, we want to get performance reports out of it, but we want to maybe be able to see them in that when we report back to our clients as well. Because at the moment, that's just time consuming, is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. correct. Um, I do know that they've embarked on a project uh, to to remedy that, mm-hmm. but I suppose what you're looking for is just some reassurance it's happening and yep. mm. a few timelines. So. Yeah. Uh, um, team at Hub, if you're if you're listening there, you've uh, you've heard it here from the original. Um, yes, that's guy. good, and we we do a lot of SMSF work too, so we're excited about that part of that piece too. Yes, so I mean I know that a lot of the SMSFs that we advise on sit inside Class, and now Hub is, owns Class as well. So potential integration benefits mm-hmm. there with our investment decisions flowing straight through to General Ledger software and preparation of accounts on a more timely basis. You just given Tim Steele a, a yeah. list of jobs to do, yeah. so. Um, <laughs> So we'll we'll leave those guys alone. We've given them their homework <laughs> for the day. So um, you mentioned you've got a licensee at the moment, and um, and and you might be looking to to um, make a move. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So we've been licensed through Matrix Planning Solutions pretty much since I joined in two thousand two thousand and one. So we've been with them a, a long time. They've now been uh, bought out by Centerpoint after Clearview exited. But we have decided and we've moved along the process of applying for our own licence. But we are using the support of La Vista, which is also part of the, the centre point world, to help us get that licence in the first instance. Yeah, and look, like like a lot of um, the evolution of a lot of businesses these days is that um, quite often the, the services that are provided by the incumbents are, are still very useful. Um, they're just they're just um, unitized now rather than sort of a one size fits all approach. I see in, in quality practices they're still using some of the service offerings that might have come out of um, you know a, an old IWF or an AMP or a Centre Point mm. Alliance. So so you, you, you're going down a path that that allows everyone a, a really sort of integrated and ease of, of a transition. Definitely, and I think it means we instead of having to get all those services from one provider, as you said, we can pick and choose the one that we think really suit us the best. And it's not necessarily about there being a best, but there's going to be one that's the best for us. Great question. I actually um, I, I, I met with the merchant uh, business um, who were in Australia recently, um, uh, and uh, I asked um, the, the CEO of Merchant, who's invested in significant numbers of business, what's the difference? And he said, in America, they outsource everything. So uh, a practice will outsource everything, and there'll be competitive tenders for everything. Mm. So the set and forget sort of backstory that we had, um, they'll outsource, you know, uh, they know what they want to do um, and they'll outsource their marketing, they'll outsource their compliance, but they'll also put it up for tender 
on a, on a, on like a, a bigger business. But um, uh, something interesting, uh, what you've just intimated is that we're heading that way. So um, yeah. Now in saying um, that with, with your actual uh, business itself, you're in North Sydney. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned some clients are remote, but is, is North Sydney the spiritual um, home of this business? Or have you got other businesses? It, well, we only have one uh, physical location, which is here in North Sydney. The, Spiritual home, well, hopefully it is becoming North Sydney now, but we were really based for the, a period of 20 years in the Sydney CBD, and I guess just the way things worked out with the timing of COVID and our office lease in Aurora Place coming up, it didn't make sense for us to renew that office lease, so we actually went fully remote for a period that About probably yeah, probably stretched pretty close to two years, probably a little bit longer than we both intended for it to be, but Technology was such that we could run the business quite well that way, but we've loved being back in one place together again. And in fact, we sort of said to the staff, if we're going to bite the bite the bullet here and start paying rent again, we want to make sure you're all on board and you all want to be together effectively five days a week. So we we have a team that now is all under one roof. And they all much said absolutely. Yeah. They said we yeah. want to be back. We want to be together. So we made sure it was a really nice office to come to. <laughs> yeah. no, it's beautiful. It is exquisite. The um. The other facet of this is that, you know, off off mic beforehand, we we're talking about well, what does the future look like? And and you intimated, and you know, hopefully, um, as part of this podcast, you, you put in you, you're putting out to the universe what you're looking to achieve. But one of them is that you're looking for other open minded people who potential who are great advisors, might have a business, but might lack a few of those elements that you've spent a lot of time, energy and effort doing. Mm. One is building a beautiful office. One is, you know, building a great marketing presence and organisational structure. Mm. So maybe towards the end, if maybe Kieran Siango, if you can just tap me on the shoulder if I forget, um, we can just make sure that, that we clearly articulate, you know, what you're looking for as well. Mm-hmm. Um, now, um, let's talk about business coaches because I had the pleasure of observing your daily huddle. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, not only did I observe it, but um, as you went around the room, I was asked for my <laughs> daily update and my key messages. So, um, put me on the spot. But uh, so, tell me what, what's the coaching philosophy that you guys have um, have embraced? So, when we purchased the business from Andrew's father in 2017, we thought, "Wow, we better get to work and." build a better business. <laughs> we had a big debt to pay off. And uh, so at that point, we hired Slipstream Coaching and uh, their model is built on, you guys have probably heard of the books, The Rockefeller Habits. I love them. Scaling up <laughs> if, if you've listened to me here, it's uh, it's an unusually, um, it's an unusual relationship I've got with them, but um, yeah. they're probably the part, big part well, of the reason that I have a lifestyle that I've got. I got to meet Vern. Oh, recently. there you go. Mr. Yes. Vern Harnish. Yes, yeah. yes. We, ha- we had a photo and a glass of wine together. That was fun. Uh, so built on built on that, and um, part of that, as you would know, is is the operating rhythm of a business being very important. So we have our ten minutes at ten daily huddle. Ten at ten, yep. Yeah, and we talk about well, first of all, we always celebrate the wins where it might be a personal win, a business win, whatever. So we always start out with the good news. Then we drop into what are we doing today. So we usually just cover two or three things that we're working on and then we call it the performance moment and that is the thing that you will get done before you leave today. And, you know, so for an advisor, it might be, you know, a great team, a great meeting with a client and for service people, it might be something different. And then obviously for us, marketing and uh, cultural folk, it might be something else. So, uh, that's really great. And then we check the calendars and then we have, we finish with anyone got any queries, anything holding you up. Have you got a pebble in your shoe? And we finish with that and it's usually wrapped up pretty quickly. And so that rhythm's daily. That's yes. daily. And, and that, that includes, um, some, some team members that, that are, that are also working and, remotely. As and well. yeah. And I have to say that the rule is that goes ahead regardless of who's around. At so the same there's only, time. yep, three same people, time every day. you do yep. it. 10 people, you do it. Yep. And then we yep. have a weekly or well, fortnightly team meeting with everybody. Yep. And uh, what's the difference between that and the So daily that's help? a bit more deep dive. Yep. So people will report in. Uh, so we'll have a marketing report, a CEO report, head of advice report, factory report. Uh, we started, Talk to me about the factory the report. The factory report. Okay. So that's okay. Crystal as our head of service, uh, you know, just 
reviewing. Have we I didn't met? see the coal soot on her face as I came <laughs> in, but uh, I like the inference. Uh, yeah, so, you know, have the meetings been scheduled? We provide an amazing thing for our clients, which we call the Wealth Journey Report, which is a bespoke it's, – it's effectively a review document, but – um Clients love it and it takes us quite a bit to produce that. So have they been done, you know, have the meetings been scheduled, who's attending the meeting, who's running the meeting, we cover off on that. And we, we've, I guess we've got monthly aims just making sure that we've ticked all those boxes. So Crystal will present that report. So Wealth Journey, sorry, wealth journey Reports um, is, is, is a key to retaining those those families, oh, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, very much so. Yep. Yes, mm. yes. So this is the this is the story of their journey with yep. us. Yeah. So we we obviously track not just their investments and their returns on their investments. We actually track their progress to the strategies that we outlaid for them at the start of the relationship. We track the change of their wealth with us over time. So. Uh, and we track it against where we thought they'd be yep. yeah. versus where they are. Yep. So so how do you celebrate when they hit milestones? And how do you hold them to account when they don't? <laughs> we have dials. <laughs> <laughs> we do have dials and we, we show them whether they're on track, you know, in the red, in the orange or in the green in different subsets of the areas of advice that we're giving them. At the moment, those milestones are celebrated in those particular meetings. But there's but probably- we also send gifts. So we yeah. might send a bunch of flowers, bottle of wine, champagne. And that we might stimulates take- referrals yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, we might like take that. them out to lunch. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. And, and, you know, the other part of your question I think which is, which is very valid as well is when, when they're not on track, uh, what, how do we deal with that? And that's a really interesting one because nine times out of ten when a client is not on track, it's not because markets didn't perform or it's not because of something that was outside of their control. It's usually because of something that was – you know, it was controllable from them. They said mm. they were going to make contributions. They didn't do it, or they said they could save this much and they didn't, or they decided to go on a family holiday that cost fifty grand. So that sort of stuff then is really clear in these particular reports, and they can see the impact that it's going to have on their long term strategy. And mm. Jackie, using the same language, mm. when your f- team, mm. the factory, the whole team, when they're achieving goals, how do you celebrate success? You know, what is fun? And then once you've answered that, which I can already see the smile drifting across your face, <laughs> how do you how do you performance manage? If okay, well let's not? start with the fun bit Agreed. first. You know, Get my personality profile. Andrew and I are both known as the funsters. So uh, we we work in ninety day increments. So we'll have three projects that we're focusing on. We'll have a meeting to vote on whether we achieved the green in each of the so, projects. So like a Russian voting style? Oh, no, or? it's like you've got, did you achieve the outcome stated? And we're all very harsh. So if we get a triple triple green in all of our projects, we will have already decided what the event will be. So uh, the team love doing fun things together. We've done things like uh, sip and paint. We've done cocktail making. The one for this quarter, if we get double greens and everything, we are going to the Sydney fish markets and we're going to do a cooking course with wine and uh, and this one, everybody's going to bring their special person, whether that's a partner or a special person in their life. So we're all looking forward to that one. I've personally done that. It's amazing. Oh, have you? Yep. Oh, good. Yep. Yeah, I've wanted to do that for a while. Yep. And in fact, a couple of years ago, we had a really big target and uh, we – we, the theme of the year was um, taking off or something. What was it? For, yeah, well, it was taking off. Anyway. We had particular financial targets yeah. and we were filling up a, a plane on the, on the whiteboard. On the way and then we got it and so we took the team for a flight around from um, a joy Rose flight. Bay yeah. up to Palm Beach and, back oh, and then had lunch. The old Pratt really and Whitney piston engine well, seaplane. And we all survived, We clearly. all survived. <laughs> we were a little worried. Uh, we've been flying them for years. <laughs> they, they almost always uh, get you back. Land so on water. <laughs> just, just, just nice and nice and loud. So um, – which is awesome. And, then, and what, before we move on to um, the second part of that question, yeah. um, how does that transfer to when you're dealing with global team members? Because lots of people um, uh, who listen to this and yeah. aspire um, yeah. to have great businesses, to have global team members, some, are, some I'm well aware of, some aren't, yeah. but it's still yeah. the common themes of success yes. is what I'm after. So VBP, as you would know, have, have their list of prizes that we can share with Shan. So we'll often say to her, look, this, what, what do you choose? What's your – so she knows what she's aiming to achieve because obviously she can't come to our lunches and all of that. So she feels very much a, a part of the celebration as well. But I think um, 
So that's that's a common thing is just treating them, uh, your global team, uh, achieving the same, celebrating the same mm. wins. Mm-hmm. Um, now we won't gloss over. What happens when you're not on track? How, how well, do you? How do you? What, look, what are the reasons? And if, and uh, if it's a performance issue, it's pretty easy to deal with. Yeah, you know, we just find out why. And usually it's a process. That's it. Mm. That's exactly what I was trying to glean yeah. is because if, if you're a boss and you just blame everything on everyone no. else, there's a failing in it, isn't no. there? So, and so. look, we're a small team, so we're big on cultural fit. Mm-hmm. And we actually recently had, had a team member who's now been off-boarded. And actually he was probably technically pretty good but not fitting with our culture, didn't align to our values. We have – our house rules, which we call our Sweet 16, and uh, they're the codes by which we behave to ensure our team's success. And when Andrew and I looked at it, he, he just wasn't meeting a whole a number of them. And um, so we we had the difficult conversation and it he's happens. now long. Yeah, so it happens. It, it's um, no problems there. That You, you know, and, you're not the first and you won't be the last. And as oh, Andrew no. said, sometimes you're doing that person a favour. Yeah. Yeah, I think once I think once you realise it's not a difficult conversation yeah. really. Once you realise that if that person's not a cultural fit with your organisation, it's actually no good for them. In the same way, it's no good for you. So that makes that conversation a lot easier to have. Mm. I think. Mm. And, and look, just changing gears a little bit while you're talking, um, I quickly went on your site mm. to your values and mm-hmm. your four suits suites of success. Oh, four suits for success. Ah, oh, we both we, we both lose Andrew on the yeah. out. Don't uh, don't. Can't uh, read. <laughs> but it, you, imagine it getting by. Your whole life on your looks, mate. Uh-huh. So, I mean, it's, it's hard not to. Uh, I think well. it's because I just said sweet sixteen. <laughs> yeah, you had maybe. Sweet maybe. On your mind. Uh, so, um, yep, the, 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 I'm reading them off here. I'm okay. assuming you guys know them by rote. Yeah. So, um, why don't you test Andrew? <laughs> so, um, a, 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 the be excellent, be caring, be direct. Yes. And be appreciative. I think the be direct was just reemphasised then. But yes, um, yes. So call, maybe call tell me how, how that how that sort of your values plays out every day in this practice. So as you saw when you arrived, they're up on the walls. Uh, We talk about them in our team meetings. We hire on them. Uh, So they're in our questionnaires, our interviews. I think they're just part of the fabric of the business. Um, Yeah. Which is excellent. And look, before um, before we go on, you've mentioned a, 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 few, a few people who've helped you out. And, and what we mm. like to do is, is add some um, links and some tools. So, I, I, mm-hmm. uh, Kieran Siango, I think we've got uh, Peloton, um, yep. Slipstream, yep. Rockefeller Habits. That's a um, great book. And uh, we can include some links there. Um, and you've is there anyone else you've got an external help, anyone marketing or, or PR? Yeah, that so used? I use Genesis. Yeah. So, Genesis, Genesis with a. Yep. There's a few Genesis in our, in so our industry. Gen- Jenny the Phil Pierce. Collin one? Oh, it's it's yes. Genesis with a J. Okay, so, so she, Jenny. Okay, great. Yeah, she helps us with our social media and marketing. Yep. Uh, obviously, we always, already shouted out La Vista yep. through yes. Matrix. Uh, we've actually just hired Fenura, and they are doing a review of our te- current tech stack and coming back to us with recommendations as to what we can use more of that we already have and what we might need to plug in because we're really at that point that we want to scale and a key part of the scalability is automating a lot of our processes. Oh, absolutely. And look, you've got you got the Microsoft already, right? You've got yeah, this I've got you've got this Ferrari in the garage yeah. co-pilot that everyone's got mm. and it's it's how to iterate and how to ensure that that you're asking the right questions and you've got the right data pond or lake. There's some body of water that where the data's in, but, um, um, and it will, it will do a lot of, uh, it will do a lot of those mundane tasks, mm. but it won't do all of them. Exactly. Not and yet. I think for us, it's about knowing, uh, you know, where, 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 where are the gaps and what can we do to fix them? So we're looking forward to that report. And obviously we have, we believe in trusted advisors. So we've got our own accountants that we work with and um, a num- who refer to us. Yeah. Give so. me a shout out. Yeah, shout out to Camp and Boston. Justin Woods, one of the partners in there. We've had a good long term relationship with him, which has been great. Awesome. Well, there you go. And so, um, now the other one um, that I look at is it's all good and well. You've had a long, long, long standing business. You've embraced technology, uh, the, the, the Fenura play at the end there about automating. It's all part of getting people to, you know, the right people doing the right things at the right time, mm-hmm. um, which is um, 
you know, a big part of the engine room and sort mm-hmm. of socialising or democratising people's good ideas because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, there's a lot of clients and there's not many people giving advice. Yes, so I think that, that spirit of cooperation um, is, is an amazing story. And I, I, But there's a lot of people supporting the financial advice industry. I heard a statistic um, very recently where there's about 15,000 ARs and there's over 100,000 people who work in those businesses. So wow. if you look at the iceberg, for every for every advisor, there's eight people um, in that associated, not just in that practice, but in, 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 in the associated businesses that are all designed or all, all working to optimise the client outcome. Mm. Now, you mentioned how you have fun, but mm. there's also um, – you know, a, a bit of a, a vein of giving back. And, and when you, whenever you look at sort of what employees or future business partners value in a, in a company or a, mm. a culture, um, being philanthropic, mm-hmm. being, being giving, um, mm-hmm. doing more than just token gestures is definitely one of them. Mm. Um, I've noticed on, on your, your website and your promotion that you do support a couple of things, but I'd love to hear more deeply how you do it, how you involve the team and why. Mm. I think for us, well, certainly for for me, running a successful business enables us to give back and we actually get a really good kick out of that. And we've aligned ourselves quite closely with a couple of charities, Australian Wildlife Conservancy and Tour de Cure. Uh, but further to that, We also support if there's a charity that one of our team members is getting involved in or clients, we're we're happy to get involved. So Can I jump in there? Yeah. Because I ran a big practice for years and Mm. that's tough because once people know you've got – that you have this this, this willingness and this, this, I suppose, empathy in human nature, how do you pick (laughs) – well, I don't. I mean, I don't think. Really I don't feel like we've been, yet. you know, taken advantage of but from that point of view. I have but. to say that when we look at it as a as a percentage of our um, profit, we we do we are very generous. Mm. But look, we're we're proud of it, and we give in terms of our time as well as in in dollars. And interestingly, one of the uh, rewards that the team want to do is for us all to have a charity day where we all go and work for a charity. So that came from the team, not from us. So yeah, totally unprompted So watch by this us. space, mm. Roxy. That mm. could be the next reward for the next quarter. So and what was the motivation for, for both of those um, charities? Quite well, often there's a personal um, yeah, I aspect think so, to them. Uh, uh, well, well, can I answer about the AWC? Sure, one? sure. Uh, growing up, Andrew was known as Harry Butler because he has a love of <laughs> animals, especially, but he can pretty much name every plant as well. And so we were looking for a charity that I guess aligned with his um, personal interests. And uh, some very good friends of ours, Guy and Georgie Ferguson, who are also very good clients, introduced us to. AWC and we went on one of their retreats, went out to the Kimberley and it was life-changing. Wonderful. And, and we mm. came back and we said, we're, we're on board. This is amazing, the work that they're doing. So it's a privately funded, you look like you want to say well, something? Well, yeah, Jump it's a, a, a privately funded charity basically for anyone that has any idea the – uh, sort of rate of extinctions in native mammals in Australia is effectively the worst in the world. We've lost more species on this continent than any other. Which and is really, really sad because we had greater diversity than any yeah. other country in the world, biodiversity. And they've really found the only way that they can protect what's left and to try and repopulate areas is to buy up tracts of land, to fence those tracts of land and then eradicate you know, most of the predators and um, you know, non-native herbivores that are in there, but particularly foxes and cats that just devastate our small mammal population. So they've been doing that and they've got places all around Australia. And if you're involved, you do sometimes get to go out and go to one of their sanctuaries and roll the sleeves up and get a bit dirty and help them with some things. So we were out in uh, Scotia, which is in far western New South Wales, sort of halfway between Mildura and Broken Hill, uh, releasing bilbies into the national park there, and it's the first time bilbies have been been there in about two hundred years. That's Menindee Lakes, sort of five. Yeah, isn't yeah it? a bit bit further down there, right. much much drier. No yeah. no lakes around, and we were there in a particularly dry time. But even then, it, what was amazing to see is the difference in the land behind the fence compared to outside the fence, where feral goats were running amok. Yeah, and look, um, um, I'll be a bit, bit direct on this one with um, 
uh, the largest, one of the largest landowners in, in this state, as all states, is the state rail. So the government um, could also pull their socks up as well mm. in relation to practicing what they preach. So maybe that might be something to bring up in your topics. Absolutely. Uh, that they, they are, um, historically, they are the largest landowner. Um, yes. Um, in the, in every part of Australia. So, um, and then the other one, um, and by the way, I didn't even put a Skippy reference in for us old enough <laughs> to uh, uh, do the Skippy the Bush Kangaroo, but I imagine that would have been a, a family favourite of yours when you were growing up. <laughs> Is that right? It was everyone, surely. Yeah. Everyone growing up in the well, 70s. There wasn't, wasn't that many shows back then, was there? <laughs> Skippy okay. was one of them. Okay, we're, lo- we're losing the Gen Zs. We're losing them. We're losing <laughs> Sorry. Them. Um, Sorry, we're back. We're back. Okay. So, and then, then the other one, um, Tour de Cure, which yeah. is which is a, a, a quite a well known. Um, yeah. So one. They, yeah. they raise funds for cancer research, and uh, also a good client of ours, and has become a good friend. Dom Robinson heads up heads up that, and uh, obviously you, you probably all know about the bike race. But uh, probably around about the time I joined Sherlock Wealth, they did their first gala event. And we hosted a table and we've doing, been doing that ever since. Uh, they now have several events. There's a gala night event. There's a lunch. And we're actually going up to Brisbane in a couple of weeks to go to a lunch that they're hosting in Brisbane, which I think is the, only, the second time. So they've raised millions of dollars for cancer research. And, uh, you know, it, that became a probably a, a personal thing as well. A few years ago, our niece suffered um, leukemia and she's she survived that. But coincidentally, that year, Tour de Cure were focusing on research for leukemia patients, the ones that survived. The, the survival rates have improved for children, but then it's it's what happens after that. So um, it's it's become close to our hearts. I've also had a couple of girlfriends that I've lost to ovarian cancer and uh, the research that they're doing in that area is very important too. So, yeah, big shout out to Tour de Cure. And uh, as a result, we've had a lot of fun too because there are some great prizes. <laughs> and uh, so we've we've got to do some really fun things in life from from that too. And the passion's evident, you know. There's uh, and some people talk about things, but you guys, as an organisation, have um, um, are committed to doing things and and. Um, you know, you mentioned before you co- you hire first on a cultural fit, mm-hmm. and having the right people on the bus. You guys are using a bus. There's buses. There's boats. There's <laughs> trains. Um, there's trains. There's, Maybe uh, we should change it back to the private back jet, to the plane, Andrew. The private jet. <laughs> well, it's not that big. We wanted to scale up, right? I don't think you can. Ch- you can't chuck too well, much we'll just in a have falcon. To have several. Um, <laughs> and and you did mention the Titanic, but um, it's good that you turned it around and didn't keep it going in the, in the same direction. That didn't work too well. No. Um, well, another thing that's that's pretty obvious. Um, just looking at from an outside looking in the outward projection of the of of the business in your social media and and your web presence and whatnot is 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 for a business that um is significantly larger than, than where you are today as far as clients when i look at this and this could be a business with 10,000 clients you know the way in which you've done it the that the us the you the invest knowledge is powerful those sorts of things um What's your vision for growing the business? Because you're 50 years in, but you're not. No. You no, bought the business. No. You guys bought the business and borrowed some money in 2017. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're kind of really seven years in, to be honest. Yeah, you're seven, <laughs> well, seven years, years in. Seven years of the new, of the the new, new regime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. dynamic duo. So, 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 and also, there's the, you've got the legacy of, of what the business was, okay, um, and where it is, and you've 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 done that all against the backdrop of the largest regulatory squeeze in in in, in industry, mm-hmm. not just this in not just this country, but any country yeah. Yeah. in the world. And um, COVID. And COVID, yeah. So <laughs> so you know, 2017 to here, uh, your babies. We want to take advantage of all the hard work that we've done with laying down the great processes, laying down the great team, laying down the great marketing, having a great org structure where we've got good separation of what people do and people are wearing the right hats. So we just recognize that we can actually now add add another advisor and if we could find a you know fabulous like-minded advisor with a book of clients who'd want to join us and come on our journey and benefit from all the work that we've done because they're probably finding I can't do it myself as the one-man band. Uh, I think that's definitely a, a great way that we could scale up. Could be one, could be ten. Yeah, we don't know. And the the other thing is, is that uh, the evolution of where we're at in financial services is that um, you're probably the longest client. Although I'm meeting with a, a client client this week, and they're sort of they've just celebrated their 50 years as well, so it's mm. the week for it. Yeah. But um, when we talk about financial planning as as a business 
92 compulsory super came in it was sort of uh, that holistic planning really kicked off late 90s early 90s indeed when Andrew when you when you parlayed into the yes. the business um the Scott, what you're looking to try and achieve here is that you've just mentioned it well you've done the work and for those people and I, I'm a fellow person who who built a practice if you have been trying to build a practice it's lonely Mm. You need it's lonely to do it, and it takes a lot longer mm. than what you think. Okay, it's easy to put stuff on a whiteboard, and why that is is because you've got people, strategy, execution, and cash. And any one of them can be your superpower, but any one of them can also be your impediment. It could yeah. be cash. You know, you might have a great business, you might have a great uh, revenue stream, but you might be in the time of your life where you've got some kids and you're trying to educate them, you're trying to pay home loans off, et cetera. So although you might be a great practitioner and we're getting a lot of them coming out of private wealth and whatnot, mm. now's not the time for them. They're quite cash poor. So plugging into a business like yourself, having an open-minded approach, might be able to you know, capitalize on their effort and also capitalize on what you've done so far. Yeah. Exactly, and I think it allows these advisors to do what they love, which is is be with the clients. Uh, you know, it, it goes back to when Andrew was spending 40%, 50% of his time running the business. Come and join ours. We're doing all that for you and uh, do what you love every day. Advisors are the best. It's so easy. I was CFP for years. There's only two things that I like to do. One is if I had a spare hour, I just would love to be in front of a client oh, signing Andrew's things. exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that the only reassurance I needed is in that same said meeting, what I said could be done by my team. <laughs> Two of those things, happy boy, repeat. Like, so easy. <laughs> that's it. But it's the last one. If you don't get the engine room right, yeah. you don't have the time yeah, the to do the fun things. Yep. And and if you're building an overall corporate business where you know, you're know looking to corporatize not just – the org structure, but even later on, you know, the share of reward and whatnot, uh, having a, a clearly defined business structure mm. um, is is quite there. So if you're in North Sydney or in – sorry, if you're in Sydney at all um, uh, and you're looking for, for a, 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 a you know, at least an alternative for a home, um, uh, you guys us. will be open. Yeah, okay, cool. And there are some great restaurants in North Sydney, so uh, we could <laughs> go out to lunch. Love Raffi. Yeah, so I've Love got a feeling America. that you'll, you'll be wanting to talk to Jackie first and foremost, <laughs> but probably – um, Andrew Love will be Rose there a. as well. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, um, and the other one is, um, what does it feel like having to have reinvented the business, kept the name, your wealth business now, and if you could go back to anything in the last ten years, what would you have done differently? Oh gosh! Well, wow, that's a hard one. Well, look, I think the first part of that question, it feel, I think we're both really proud of what mm, we've achieved. To be honest, really proud. Uh, when we look back, I sort of laugh about this sometimes, but I talk about that period from when dad started to when I joined from 1970 to 2000, and I'm probably simplifying it a bit here, but I, I don't think there was any major regulatory change over that entire time period. And then from the time that no, I- they went from gas to electricity <laughs> yeah, maybe. on the streets. I think that Harbour Bridge there, they let, they let um, automobiles on. That's right. They stopped so, paying with, you know, 20 cent coins. Correct, correct, correct. <laughs> but then pretty much since I've been on board and then when Jackie joined, it's just been this constant oh, regulatory just... change. And I think the thing we're most proud of is we've been, we've been out ahead of the wave in a surfing analogy. You know, when we, we weren't stuck with corporate super clients that we couldn't service or Price anymore. We weren't stuck with grandfathered commissions. Uh, we'd, we'd transitioned. We'd been. We'd had enough foresight to transition the business to a way that meant that we could get through this period. And now, I think that we actually we've la- we've done that. We've laid down that back office sort of stuff. We're ready for the next phase. Awesome, Jackie. Anything to add? No, that was that was amazing. But the one thing I say to my team all the time is the one constant we can rely on is change. So. Uh, yeah, we're good at pivoting. We, we often say we're good at pivoting and adapting. And um, I think we've been good as leaders at looking ahead at what's to come. And even if you're only just a little bit ahead, it it's important. So we haven't been dumped yet by that big wave. We've managed to stay on the surfboard just out in front. Uh, but we're enjoying the ride. So come on board. Come ride with us. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, for your first podcast, you've done really well. Oh, thank you. No mishaps at all. Uh, um, and, and the well, only mishap well, we're editing out. 
Um, and uh, if you know the guys, or, or, or you might want to ask, but it was great, and it um, yet again had uh, sort of elements of the the great gesticulation curse that happens to every single person on a podcast, and um, it was fantastic. Look, I've I've really enjoyed um, I've enjoyed uh, work today, but I've also enjoyed working with you for for some years. Um, you do what you say you're going to do. Um, the Sherlock um, business is been around forever, but it looks like it's going to be around for a long time. So thank you very much on behalf of uh, Ensemble and the Engine Room. Thanks, Roxy. Thanks, Roxy. Great to be with you. It's been very fun.